Welcome to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? I'm Erin Summers. I'm a sports broadcaster that's covered the Atlantic Coast Conference for a very long time, and I grew up a fan. I've always been curious what players do after we obsess over them in college. This podcast answers that question. Each week, you'll hear an interview with a former ACC athlete. We'll find out everything they've been doing since playing in college. Thanks for listening. Let's jump in to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? This week, I'm joined by former NC State guard Derek Wittenberg. Wittenberg played a major role on the 1983 National Championship team, averaging nearly 16 points per game his senior season. After a brief professional career, Wittenberg pursued coaching and is now back at his alma mater as an associate athletic director for community relations and student support. Here's our conversation. Oh, should I call you coach? Is that what we're doing? Coach Wittenberg or <laughs> Mr. Wittenberg? <laughs> uh, whatever you feel comfortable with. Yep. Hey, either way, I'm happy to have you on here. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about your playing days and being back at NC State again now. Where are you calling in from? Uh, I'm currently at uh, in Raleigh, and I'm uh, associate athletic director at NC State. Uh, been back since 2013 and uh, went into administration in 2015. And so now I'm currently working um, primarily for the athletic department and, and for the university as well. So uh, it's good to be back in Raleigh and good to be back at my alma mater. Absolutely. Your history with NC State goes back quite a ways. But even before that, what was it that got you into basketball? Well, you, you're getting into my book that I'm going to write this year. But oh, okay. uh, starting off in Washington, D.C. as a young, young, young guy getting into sports, um, I started playing boys club basketball and um, then a little bit of AAU. And then I attended one of the most prestigious high schools in the country, uh, DeMatha High School where I played for the first high school coach in the Hall of Fame, Morgan Wooten. And uh, I, I think the transition from boys club um, and going to a school that, uh, like the statue of DeMatha really put me on the map in terms of my basketball career, obviously. And during that time in the uh, mid-'70s, the ACC was the premier conference in the country and the first conference that was – heavily on TV. And so I uh, ended up following my cousin, David Thompson, who played in the early 70s to NC State. And that's basically how I got into basketball and really what, what brought me to NC State. While you were at DeMatha, you won a national championship your junior year there, playing with somebody Wolfpack fans are familiar with and Sidney Lowe, former NC State basketball coach. And you mentioned your cousin, David Thompson, one of the best to play there at state, won a national championship in 1974 with the team. What was it about state, about your cousin that really drew you in? Well, I had some unique experiences and uh, humbled by all the relationships that, uh, that brought me to state. And uh, I would go back to my, one of my best friends in life, Sidney Lowe, who I met as a sophomore. Uh, there, he was tabbed as the best uh, guard or player in the D.C. area, and I was tabbed as the best um, young player in, in the Maryland area, and we ended up being at the same school and playing with each other. And uh, we only lost seven games in high school, and like you mentioned, uh, winning Morgan's first national championship going undefeated at 28-0 in our junior year was, was obviously special. And but back in our day, uh, it, it, it was an honor and a privilege to have a, an opportunity uh, to to get a college scholarship for one. Mm -hmm. And number two, to play in a league like the ACC. That was uh, that was big stuff. If you if you accomplish those things, uh, that was really big back in the day. And, and uh, so through our success at the math of, we got a lot of opportunities. Obviously, we got recruited by all the major schools in the country. But uh, my focus exactly was that I wanted to play the ACC. When you got to NC State, 
you ended up having a coaching change. Coach Valvano came in. What was he like as a coach? How did you enjoy playing for him? Well, it was uh, it was quite a transition because we loved Norm Sloan too. He was a mm -hmm. great coach and uh, well respected, and uh, he had recruited us, and then we had no idea they was going to leave after our after our freshman year, and uh, we didn't know what to expect. We were young and excited. We just went twenty and eight. We lost in the first round, which we thought we could have made a run at the NCAA uh, at the Final Four, uh, but that didn't happen. So we still had a good team. And um, Norm leaves, and we didn't really we didn't know what to expect. We we thought at one point that my high school coach Morgan Wood was going to come, mm -hmm. but after that, we we didn't know what was going to happen. And in walks this crazy, funny personality Italian guy, uh, Jim Vavano coming in, and then uh, we didn't know what to expect. But uh, uh, from day one, there was something special about him there was something uh there was some comfort about his approach to players and his philosophy and uh, and um, we just took to him it seemed like that team during those years had a lot of fun when we see a lot of you and your teammates reliving that 1983 national championship run what are some of your best memories from your time as a player at nc state well, uh, we, we did have fun, and, and Val Valdo encouraged that. He encouraged mm -hmm. a, a family atmosphere. Uh, he was a player's coach, meaning that what's a player's coach? That he was uh, very open, uh, wanted us to be have ownership in the team, always sought our advice in the games and in practice. Uh, really, we, we had a relationship with the coach, uh, which is not as uh, – True, yeah, today it's a little different, but back then, Valvano, we had a relationship. We had fun. He wanted us to have fun. He said it was a game, and uh, and he also wanted us to be a family. And so my, my truest, my, my greatest uh, memories of my team is that we, we, we just had, you know, everybody talks about it. Everybody talks about culture, but we, we, we had a family atmosphere and, and respect for each other, a lot of togetherness. And everybody was about the team and about the, the number one goal, and that was to win the national championship. You won a national championship in high school, and you did it in college. Which one was better? I don't know if one, one was better than the other uh, because you never imagine that. You're never going to, to a high school and thinking that, you know, we're going to win the national championship. We're going to win the city championship, obviously. Mm -hmm. That was very, very important. Uh, we didn't know much about the national championship, but that's uh, what we got on the scene because we, the math, we played a national schedule. We traveled and played all over the country and played the top teams. And so the math was a national high school program at the time. And uh, winning it, it's, it's probably more special now than we realized back then sure. when we were, were juniors mm -hmm. in high school. But the one thing that people didn't understand is that Sydney and I, and no disrespect to anybody else, we understood what it took. We, we expected to win. We only lost seven games in high school. We didn't know anything about losing. So we understood, you know, the process of being a champion. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, our personalities, we brought that to our team. And, uh, and I think Valvano realized the, the chemistry that we had, but more importantly, the leadership that we had between Sydney and I and Thurl, three guys coming from the Washington, D.C. area that were together and that, that, that loved each other and cared about each other. But more importantly, we all had that common goal. And uh, so I thought our, our, what we brought to the table, really our leadership bonded the team well. Looking back on your college career, what stands out most to you about NC State, the program and university? Well, what stands out the most for me right now after being there in 1979, so this is 30, 37, 38 years, I can put everything in perspective, perspective in terms of I gained so much from the experience. 
you know, it, you, you go to college and it was fortunate enough that you achieved the winter national championship. I think I came out a more mature uh, uh, person and a better mm -hmm. person. And I also came out as a college graduate and a person of it, uh, that's educated. And I think that, that was, that, that was the goal. And that's what we should be talking about now. These student athlete, right? What, what, right. what do you want to accomplish as a student athlete? And the fourth thing that I think from my experience at NC State is that uh, my coaches and the people, my professors and the people that I'd encountered prepared me for life after college. See, I think today they only think about uh, now. Um, uh, we want to win and we want to go to the NBA. But I think back then, now we thought back then, uh, our, our coaches, our parents, Everybody that still loves the, the words in character, integrity, and education was important that, yeah, yes, it's important to be successful as an athlete, but if you're not playing anymore, you can be successful as an individual. And I think that's what NC State and their relationships to prepare me later on. Listen, in 2016, I was the first athlete to give the commencement speech in Reynolds Coliseum. Now, who would have thought a guy that was a basketball player that uh, coming to NC State, that later on in life, I was asked to be, to give the commencement speech at NC State. To me, that's accomplishment. Absolutely. What was the theme of that commencement speech? The theme was that number one, uh, I was accessible. Number two, I was free. And number three, that I wouldn't be too long. Because I've been to many <laughs> commencement speeches, and, and, and everybody thinks one thing I've been a motivational speaker for the last 25 years for companies all over the country. And one thing you learn as a speaker is that the speech or the conversation is not about you, it's about your audience. And I wanted to make sure that I was speaking to the audience, to the parents who are proud of their graduates. And I also wanted to give my experience. I, did, I never talked about sports. I talked about the time when I introduced Ronald Reagan in, in Reynolds Coliseum. I talked about the time when I walked in that Coliseum with my parents and put my cap and gown on in Reynolds Coliseum. And I talked about the wonderful experience that I have and that you all are going to go forward because not only that you're educated, but you have gained a lot of great relationships and opportunities uh, that, that you can use going down in your journey. And I think the speech was about 14 minutes and people loved it. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. I mean, we all like, we want short weddings. We want short speeches. That, that's right. You, you, yeah, it. You, if you're the commencement speech, you got to be short and sweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After you graduated from NC State, I know you said education was important. However, you did go to the NBA and pursue a professional career drafted by the Phoenix Suns. Um, 51st pick, so a little bit different. The draft was a little different back then, a little bit longer, huh? Yeah, it was 12, 12 rounds, and, uh, and, and uh, I was kind of the uh, 51st pick. I don't know what that meant, but uh, I went to the Phoenix Suns. I was the last guy that was cut. Um, that was an interesting experience. I mean, it 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 wasn't. Uh, it was like uh, after training camp, off the bus. The guy said, "Well, you cut," and that was it. You know, that's that's how life is, right? That's the reality. You know, and that's what I teach kids today. College is an ideal world. It's not the real world. Mm -hmm. And then the real world sh certainly smacked me in the face, going from a national champ to. Uh, you know, being cut, and, and now I got to find my career. Do I pursue my career uh, in basketball? Uh, do I move on uh, to something else? Uh, you know, that's the decisions you have to make uh, in, in your career. And I, uh, and I made it pretty quickly. I went over and played. I, I was a graduate assistant for a year with Jim Valvano, and I went and played over Europe. And then when I, uh, when I was over in Europe, Valvano asked me would I come back and help him coach and I came back and that started my uh my coaching career when you were growing up what was your goal did you want to be a professional player or did you always have 
some idea of being a coach down the line. I, I did want to be a professional uh, player, and uh, but I also didn't want to chase basketball because mm -hmm. I, I felt like that, um, you know, I didn't have to have basketball. And I think what's sad about some of our players today is that they think that that's all they can do. That's basketball was a part of me and part of, of, of a talent that, that I could be successful, but I knew one day it was going to end. And I, I just didn't pursue chasing basketball. I could have continued to play in Europe and bounce around, but I decided that I want to do something. I want to do something else. And I decided to get into coaching and, and I did. Yeah, I mean, you were an assistant coach for a while, lots of different places, NC State, George Mason, Long Beach State, Colorado, West Virginia, Georgia Tech, another ACC school. You kind of went over to the enemy. What did you enjoy about coaching? Uh, I enjoyed, uh, like I said, I obviously I enjoyed the competition, but I enjoyed the relationships. I still have a lot of relationships with at, at guys at all those schools, <clears throat> all the kids I recruited, all the kids I coached, all the, the coaches that I worked with, Gail Catlett, who's in the Hall of Fame, Joe Harrington, uh, Bobby Crimmins, all the guys that I, I worked for, uh, I had great relationships and still, uh, you know, have those relationships today. And that's what I cherish the most. Um, <clears throat> the most interesting school was obviously Georgia Tech, mm -hmm. being back in the league. It wasn't like being in North Carolina, but it was at another school, and it was it was weird when I would come to NC State and be sitting on the opposite bench. Yeah, and uh, and also beating NC State quite a bit when I was at Georgia Tech with uh, with our team. But uh, uh, that was an interesting. But Bobby Crimmins is a wonderful guy to work for. Uh, loved him. Uh, taught me so much, and uh, I I just you know the coaching was really rewarding and then when I became a head coach it, it was in a, you know I was the first uh African-American coach at, at Wagner to win a championship the only um NCAA championship they have there in basketball I did that in 2003 um we also was, was the first team that had a, a 3.0 GPA for four years with six guys on the Dean's list so we had tremendous success not only on the court but off the court and my kids never got in trouble. And then, then I went on to another great academic school in Fordham. And uh, we had success there. And, and then I was later in uh, 2010, I was fired. And uh, I, I tell you, everybody thinks it's doom and gloom when you get fired. But that was one of the best things that happened in my life. <laughs> you, you didn't know it at the time, right? You're being fired and you're not working. You don't know why. But, you know, people make decisions and um, you got to reflect on it and look at uh, what you need to do, what, what you need to improve on and, and, and going forward. What, what, what's your next step? And if I wouldn't have got fired, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to produce Survive in Advance, mm -hmm. which is the most watched sports documentary in the world. So a lot of good things happen out of being fired at Fordham. So I thank Fordham in so many ways. They gave me an opportunity. They fired me, but they also helped me put my alma mater back on the map in the V Foundation by, by producing two two-hour films for 30 for 30 for ESPN, which was, 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 was great. It was a great experience. Sure, they pushed you into the next opportunity there after they fired you. How did that yeah. executive producer role come about with ESPN and, and the ability to produce that 30 for 30? Well, it goes back to Fordham University did not, at the time, they didn't have a website and they wasn't, uh, didn't have the, the resources for, to, to have websites and technology. So I actually started a website uh, with Jonathan Hawk's company who helped me produce a website on DerekWittenberg.com that uh, I can uh, interview other coaches and we can put our recruiting on this website. So that was the website that our, our coaches used was DerekWittenberg.com to, to promote our programs because we didn't have we didn't have it at the athletic department. So that was my first relationship with John Hawk. And then later I called John Hawk when I saw the Fab Five and I told him that I said, you know, I got a story about the NC State. I think that that's worthy 
uh, for, for ESPN and 30 for 30. And uh, we put it together. And uh, we had no idea how it was going to turn out. We were just telling the story. Mm-hmm. It was about me telling a story 30 years, uh, 30 years ago about these wonderful guys, my teammates and Valvano, who, you know, what that journey was like. And uh, it couldn't have came out any better. What was your pitch on why that story had to be told? Well, the story was real. Uh, we had uh, a guy with a vision and a plan from day one, Jim Valvano. It was an extraordinary run. I don't know if we've ever seen a run like that in the history of sports, mm-hmm. the way it all happened. Uh, it, it, it just, you, you can't make it up. Uh, during the ups and downs of the season, uh, me being hurt and missing 12 games and then coming back. And, you know, the, the storyline is just incredible. And so, so we just told the story. And uh, we didn't embellish it at all. We just told it exactly like it was. And uh, it's just an incredible journey with Jim Valval and a, and a group of, you know, ordinary guys achieve, achieving something that's extraordinary with, with – the chemistry and the and the camaraderie we have with that team, it's it, it's hard to duplicate that. I'm not mm-hmm. saying that everybody doesn't have it, but the way we did it was just extraordinary. And the last second shots and winning at the last minute at the buzzer. I mean, it, it, it was just an incredible journey. It's a great watch. Again, it's Survive in Advance, the 30 for 30, if anybody wants to check it out. But that's not the only one that you helped produce. You did another one about – the football coach at Colorado called the gospel according to Mac. Yeah. Bill McCartney. I was there. I was at Colorado from 90, uh, uh, 90 to 93. And um, I, I befriended Bill McCartney and uh, what a powerful coach. He went there and built the program. He had such a contrast. Well, I would say I thought it was a conflict. You know, he was a highly religious individual that was coaching at a major conference in football, hmm. which th- that person, that, th- that wasn't, there was nobody like him out there. And, uh, and telling that story about his daughter's relationship with Salonessi, the great quarterback, and them having a kid, and, and then Ted Salonessi getting diagnosed with cancer, and then all the trials and tribulations of Colorado in terms of the race relations, how – uh, Coach McCartney had to deal with that and dealing with the religion, dealing with the situation with his daughter and his star quarterback and trying to be successful and winning at the same time. Uh, what, what a story. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it's a powerful story. It's got everything in it. And uh, he was just a polarizing figure that really believed in those kids and, and believed in his faith. And, and um, uh, once again, another real, documentary that uh, uh, basically they just told it like it was and uh, a, a tremendous story. What projects are you working on? What's coming up for you? I uh, heard something about a ACC documentary, a 10 part series on the ACC tournament. Uh, ESPN and Jonathan, they um, decided to do this project uh, a year ago and they, they called me. And, uh, and I'm a part one of the producers and I'm part of the project. And uh, I tell you, the interviews have been, you know, it, it's, it's been, it, it's been incredible The interviews. I, I can't tell. I've learned so much uh, about the history of the ACC. It makes me more proud to be a part of ACC. So uh, stay tuned. It's coming. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. So when does it come out? Uh, hopefully it's uh, probably, uh, no later than sometime in the fall. Okay. If we get to finish, uh, all the interviews and whatever, because the pandemic has obviously slowed some of that down in terms of interviewing, but, uh, right. um, uh, we, 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 we really feel really good about the, the work and what we're doing. And, 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 uh, this is a great league. And I think this, this documentary will, will really shine some light on that. You spent some time with TV, and then you came back to NC State as an assistant coach again. Why did you decide to come back, and how did that opportunity come about? 
Well, it, it, it really, it, it, it was by accident. Uh, uh, Mark Garfrey, I, I called him up and talked to him about the program and everything. And he said, you know, I want you back involved in the program. And I said, um, yeah, that's great. I'll support you with any way I can. And there was a position over. And I think Larry Farmer, who was uh, a player development, had left. And uh, he asked me to help him uh, find somebody for that position. And then at the end of the conversation, he said, would you be interested? And I was thrown back. I said, well, not really. But he said, think about it, because I, I think I want you. <laughs> and that's how the conversation ended. And uh, and next thing you know, I, I I was I was back, but on on one on two conditions. Number one, I didn't come back because I I wanted to come back and and help Godfrey in the program, but I necessarily didn't want to come back uh, the, to be a coach. Mm. I wanted to help the program. Number two is that I always thought about I wanted a, a, a bigger role with the university. And so uh, uh, Coach Garfield and I made a pact that in three years I would not pursue another coaching job, and I would stay there at NC State. And then after two years, I would look for an opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to be in the university in the athletic department. So after two years, I, pres I presented a proposal and the Chancellor and Debbie Yao got together, and here I am six years later. Associate Athlet Athletic Director, Community Relations and Student Support. What does that mean? All the above. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> All the above. That includes uh, mentoring, helping kids uh, uh, come back to school and graduate, uh, mentoring our coaches, uh, helping them recruiting. Uh, fundraising. I mean, all the relationships and the connections I have back here at NC State, um, all the above. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my outreach in the community uh, between being on the board of the V Foundation and have my own foundation and all the other events I'm involved in, all the events I'm involved in NC State, it just fits who I am. And uh, uh, being a uh, uh, you know, my alma mater and being back here for the third time uh, as a coach, I mean, I can, I got a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge about the university in, in, in Raleigh and North Carolina. So it, it's, it's a good fit for me. Uh, it's more, it's not a job for me. It's uh it's a calling. And, uh, and I'm excited every day that I get an opportunity uh, to help our university. Okay, so if I'm a prospective student, sell me on NC State. Well, first of all, at NC State, if you uh, uh, congratulations on being uh, accepted at NC State. We want you here, but we, we, we want you here because uh, we, we're going to take care of you. Uh, we're going to support you. Uh, we think you belong. You know, we, we want everybody to win here. Win at NC State means that you're worthy you intelligent and you're necessary. So we, we're going to ensure that you get all the support to be successful here and that we have everything here for you, not only while you're here, but hopefully that we can enhance your career once you leave NC State. So, so we would a, love to have you. Is this a good or bad time to tell you I went to UNC? Well, I kind of figured you went to UNC because <laughs> I see that light blue uh, Michael Jordan uh, Nikes back there. So yeah, yeah. I did. I did I want. I didn't want to start this podcast off being being you know rivalry. I, I wanted to have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you uh, not being too rough on me because I went to the school down the street. <laughs> but I still convince you that you know you can look at NC State maybe at graduate school. See, yeah, so, there so you, you still go. Can look at NC State. <laughs> yeah, I love it. You mentioned that you like to do a lot of community service. You have charity of your own. But what is that charity and? And how are you involved? Well, uh, you know, uh, once again, I, I, you know, 27 years ago, going on 28 years ago, uh, Valvano uh, put me as a founding member on the Jimmy V Foundation. That we are proud of what the work that we've done of raising awareness of cancer and raising money and, and also, you know, um, 
raised a lot of money for research. We've given out over 500 grants across the country. Uh, 100 percent of every dollar goes directly to cancer research. We raise almost a half a billion dollars. That's leveraged a billion dollars and given out grants into our investigators and researchers across the country. Very proud of that work. Part of Jim Valvano's legacy, obviously. And then uh, five years ago, I started uh, my passion project uh, with my wife, the Derek Whitberg Foundation. We uh, award scholarships to help juniors and seniors finish school. Mm -hmm. So we've awarded uh, over a hundred scholarships and, uh, and and close to well over five hundred thousand dollars. So we're proud of that. There's a lot of organizations that advocate uh, for kids getting in school, but our focus is to help kids finish, especially during this time of the pandemic and 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 um, with with economic uh, difficulties, with people losing jobs. We want to help kids uh, get to the finish line. Yeah, that's great. It's a really important thing that you brought up, you know, making sure kids finish school, not only just getting in. So that's really great. Yeah, and people talk about community. Community is being involved and being present. And so the last five years of being involved in 192 events, including NC State events and community events and events across the state and all over the country, that not only that we support our own, we support others. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be a true person of community and get involved, you got to get involved and be a part of a little bit of everybody else. So you can't just ask people to support your causes. You also have to support their causes as well. It sounds like you're staying busy. You said 192 events at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. I uh, mean, the, the, that's the crazy. pandemic has slowed me down, but you know what? <laughs> I'm catching up on zoom. This is my 762 podcast on Zoom. And so it slowed me down, but it's not going, it's not going to hinder me. <laughs> That's insane. And just in this past year, you've done over 700? In the last year and a half, yes. 762. Ooh. I've been counting them. Yeah. Podcasts and Zoom calls and, you know, from anywhere from economics to education to race. Uh, anything that which you can educate people and empower people, uh, there's work to be done. You know, I found my, you know, I found my purpose. My purpose is to serve. And what, what a wonderful purpose that is. And it's rewarding and nothing better than helping kids and people and helping them find their journey and helping them find their way. So, um, uh, I'm excited every day to be a part of that. Generally, I would ask people what they plan on doing in five years, maybe 10 years down the road, but it sounds like you're pretty happy with where you're at. Is this something oh, you're man. just going to continue listen, to do? Listen, listen, you know, the, the good Lord gives us all a lot of talent. It's up to us to find our purpose. But at the end of the day, your purpose is to serve and to be as successful as you can so you can do what? Help others. And, and, and that's what we do. That's what all of us do. We all have our own journey, our unique journey. We all have our talent. We, we got to maximize our talent and our ability to not only help ourselves in our careers, but help others. Because your success is going to be important to other young journalists down the road. So one day you're going to be standing in front of them and telling their story. My story is about helping uh, kids and coaches and players and companies and, and to share the experiences and the successes and the relationships that I have, you, you know, if that's going to enhance their journey and going to help their and, and help them be successful. I really appreciate it. I had a great time talking to you. You definitely have a unique and special perspective on things and NC State is lucky to have you there. <laughs> Well, I, I'm humbled to be there and honored to be there and to serve uh, for my athletic director, Boo Corrigan and, and Dr. Woodson and all the students. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's humble. It's, it's an honor for me to be back in my alma mater. No, thank you so much for the time. Uh, thank you. 
Thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you don't ever miss an episode of ACC Stars, Where Are They Now?